Okay, so um, welcome everyone. My name is Harriet O'Neill and I'm Assistant Director for the Fine Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences here at the BSR. And it's great pleasure to welcome both our virtual audience and also our physical audience tonight for a lecture by our Boston Fellow, Flavia Marcello. So thank you very much, Flavia, you're behind me. Behind me. Um, thank you for joining us and for being such, making such a wonderful contribution to our community over the last three months. So Flavia is an Associate Professor of Architectural History at Swinburne School of Design and Architecture, a member of the Centre for Transformative Media Technologies. She teaches architectural design, history and theory with a particular focus on global and social themes and leads a research team of virtual heritage, um, it, yeah, the reader team of virtual heritage, user experience experts, and VR artists who recreate embodied experiences of past exhibitions and temporary pavilions. She is a world expert on the urban history of Rome, as well as the art and architecture of the Italian fascist and post-war periods. Her areas of research include the relationship between space and ritual, the political use of classicism, and the legacy of fascism in contemporary society. She's published articles in Modern Italy, Rethinking Histories, and the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians. And her monograph on the Italian Istrian architect Giuseppe Pagano um, came out with Intellect Press in 2020. I should have checked how you pronounce his surname. And she is currently working on a monograph that charts the many aspects of the fascist legacy in Rome, which we're here about tonight. So before I hand over to our speaker tonight, I just want to explain that I'll mute myself and we'll come back at the end of the lecture. The virtual audience, please ask questions via the Q&A function. Live audience, there'll be a roving microphone. So do you think of questions you can pose to our speaker tonight? Um, so over to you with the time title, Rome at War, Urban Memories from the Death of the Regime to the Birth of the First Republic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Harriet. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for the wonderful introduction. So, oh, I can take my mask off. Yay. <laughs> um, right, so tonight, we're going to do something a little bit sort of experimental and new for the BSR but something that we hope is in the true spirit of interdisciplinary collaboration. So my talk tonight is going to be accompanied by a film made by our fellow fellow, Etienne de Rosier, and Pepe will also be making a guest appearance towards the end of it. So I'm just gonna press play on the film. So the title is A Story of Love and war. And I'm going to start tonight by reading a diary entry from Palma Bucarelli, who was a director of the Galleria Nazionale di Arte Moderna from 1942 to 1975. One to celebrate this extraordinary woman who worked hard to save the artworks that you can go and see there today by dividing them up between the Castel Sant'Angelo and Palazzo Farnese in Caprarola. Two, because it shows how fast the news of this event traveled throughout the city. And three, because it ties us to this place where we are right now. 23 March, 1944, ceremonies for the anniversary of the foundation of the fascists still, and bombs at Via Rosella on a group of Nazi police, 32 are dead and others wounded. Shootings between four and seven in Via del Tritone and surrounds, it's big. The Germans, I have to pause this because that's not quite long enough, sorry. Um, <clears throat> the Germans are threatening a big reprisal and have arrested a lot of people. It seems though that a lot of those rounded up at Palazzo Barberini have managed to escape. So now I'm gonna introduce to you the protagonists of tonight's story. Here you can see a group of Gapisti, uh, members of the um, action squad, squads of the partisans, taken in 1944. Uh, the names uh, there in red are the people that actually took part in the Via Rosella attack, which is the theme of tonight's story. Uh, and you can see that in the centre we have Carla and Sasa, who are our main characters, and Laura and Giulio. At the bottom we have Silvio Serra, who was involved in the attack as well, but wasn't there on the day of the photo, uh, nor was Guglielmo Blasi, He's, a, he's the nasty looking one at the bottom because he was a traitor and actually um, meant, led to the arrest of some of his comrades. 
And then we have Giorgio Amendola in the bottom corner. He's not really involved in the attack, but as leader of, as a partisan leader, he took responsibility for it in, in the aftermath. So we're going to hear the story. We're going to hear the story of what happened on the 25th anniversary of the founding of fascism. Who placed those bombs? Who was killed? Who was rounded up in front of Palazzo Barberini? And what was that big reprisal that was being threatened? In the best Tolstonian tradition, it is not just a story about bombs and war and reprisal killings. It is a love story about a girl and a boy who in one single day will change each day that comes after it. What they do on the 23rd of March, 1944, will reverberate throughout their lives, throughout the lives of hundreds of others who suffered during Rome's days of Nazi occupation and throughout the lives of every Italian living today. The bomb they and their fellow partisans set off in Virazella has left barely a trace on the contemporary city, but its shrapnel is nearly everywhere in the form of hundreds of plaques, tripping stones, and monuments that commemorate the 335 people assassinated in the reprisal killing of the Fosse di Artine the next day. So I'm interested in this tracelessness. So I decided to track it down through the memories of our two main protagonists, Carla Caponi and Sasa o Rosario Bentivegna. And here are their books. And these are the main sources that I got for the telling of this story. I haven't used historical sources. I've used memories of the two people who are actually involved in the attack. So Etienne and I have created a filmic trace by walking the same paths they took through the city on that fateful day. Walking is always the best way to get to know a city, but in this case, walking is all the more important because it was about the only way you could get around in Rome in March, 1944. Only the richest people could afford a car and if you had one, it was likely it had been requisitioned by the Nazis. Many tram lines had been suppressed and bicycles had been banned since the 20th of December, 1943, because it was a preferred vehicle for throwing bombs. So this is the route that is, these are the main routes of the, um, of the day. So this is the column of Nazi soldiers who start from Via Flaminia, walk up via the Babuino and take a corner here, up Virazella, and then they would have, if they hadn't got bombed, uh, continued all the way up to the Viminale, which is the Ministry of the Interior, which is where they were stationed. Carla and Sasa start from here in Via Marco Aurelio, walk along the Via de Fori Imperiali, and then they, their paths split. So first we're going to follow Sasa's journey up the Quirinale and down to the spot where the bomb goes off in Virazella. Then we're going to do a kind of flashback and then follow Carla's route uh, up the other way and where she then also passes Virazella and then they go home after the bombing. So Carla and Sasa are walking from their refuge in the cellar of Via Marco Aurelio 47, where there's a Santa Barbara. There's our Santa Barbara there. Santa Barbara is basically an arsenal and Santa Barbara was the patron saint of people who were in danger of death. So a very appropriate patron saint for partisans. So there's an everyday apartment block in Via Marco Aurelio. And they had been living in the cellar of this apartment block since they'd gone clandestine to avoid arrest. This was provided by their friends, Dulio Grigioni. Dulio was a concierge of the apartment block and he was a short skinny man with a shock of white hair that flopped over his round face. Carla, Sasa, and their fellow Gapisti slept there on the floor, waking every morning with their bones aching, surrounded by an arsenal, TNT, mortars, guns, anything they could get their hands on. Via Marco Radio 47 was in fact codenamed Santa Barbara. And it was moved there after the original one in Via Giulia, run by architecture student Giorgio Labo and chemistry professor Gianfranco Matte had been discovered. The resistance in Italy actually took many forms. There were active resistance carried out in the violent and deadly attacks on Nazis and fascists. These were the Gruppi di Azione Patriotica, Patriotic Action Group, and their members were called Gapisti. Each group had a leader and Rome was divided into military zones, 
Cardla and Sasa operated in zone four, which covered part of the Centro Storico. But resistance is not just about violence. There are many forms of what have been unfortunately called passive resistance, which was anything but passive. This included many of the roles that women played or were allowed to play in the resistance, like hiding Jews, deserters, carabinieri, and at one point, any man between the age of 17 and 70, distributing clandestine press, throwing communist flyers over people's heads in the cinema, sabotaging supplies and vehicles, and then graffiti. A lot of partisans did any of all of the above of these things. In the cellar that you've just seen, Sasa has just put on the typical outfit of a neturbino, a street sweeper, that was given to them by a com comrade. Ralph Falcioni, a taxi driver, had stolen a street sweeper's cart from a deposit near the Colosseum. The outfit was a dark blue shirt of rough fabric, matching hat, with a black visor that looked a lot like the gray green ones worn by World War I soldiers. He was also wearing a pair of old trousers and beat up shoes tied up with a little piece of red string. Sasa had been briefed about what to say should he get stopped because all the Neturbini working in the Centro Storico knew each other and they also had regular routes. They would have been wondering, who is this guy? And what's he doing sauntering down Via del Impero? The plan was to say that he was using the cart to deliver cement and make a little bit of extra cash on the side to feed his family. In the days leading up to the attack, um, the married couple, Giulio Cortini, a physicist, and Laura Garroni, a student who later became a librarian, had been building the bomb. Bomb was inside a round metal casket with a sliding lid that had been put together at the gas works and then was filled with 12 kilos of TNT that had been provided by Colonel Montezemolo, a partisan contact within the army. They added a good amount of steel fragments and then slid it shut. The fuse was 50 centimetres long, and that was one centimetre for each of the 50 seconds it would take for the column of soldiers to march past the narrowest section of Vera Zedla. Carla and Sasa helped them pack the bomb into one of the bins, and that was quite a feat getting that heavy thing upstairs. Carla and Laura keeping a lookout, Giulio, Raul and Sasa struggling with the load. Giulio may have been short and skinny, but he was strong, and with his help, they made it out into the street. Once up in the foyer, they packed another six kilograms of TNT around the bomb. And then it came time to cover it with garbage because it was a garbage truck. Now that might sound like a simple task, but try finding garbage around the street in a city where people are starving and not throwing anything away. Sorry, just waiting for the video to catch up. This is an experiment after all. So their entire lived experience, sorry, and this is, I um, just want to show you where they're going. They're now um, coming around this part of the Colosseum here. They've just walked down the Marco Aurelio. For their entire lived experience, the 23rd of March was a day celebrated with much pomp and circumstance as the anniversary of the foundation of fascism, but not this year. The city was too dangerous. Gapisti had been mounting targeted attacks for months. Cardla herself had blown up a truck and bombs had been set off at the Hotel Flora in Via Veneto and the Cinema Barberini, where Nazi soldiers could catch up on the latest work by Lenny Riefenstahl. So this year it had been decided to celebrate on the quiet with a small ceremony at the shrine of fascist martyrs behind the Campidoglio and speeches in the main hall of the Palazzo delle Corporazioni in Via Veneto. It was a glorious spring day, the sun is shining and the sky is that special shade of blue that you only see in Rome. In 1944, it was the kind of day that Romans had begun to dub Bombers Day because this is the kind of weather that provides the best visibility for the B-17s and B-24s of the US Air Force that had recently been flying across the city and causing so much damage, sometimes levelling entire blocks 
in suburbs like San Lorenzo. Before walking to the Santa Barbara, Carla and Sasa had walked around from Carla's house near the Forum of Trajan to go and have lunch at the Birreria Dreher in Piazza Santi Apostoli. The waiter knew them and charged them a fixed price of a few lire. It never quite filled their bellies, but it kept the hunger at bay for a bit. 12 o'clock was early for midday meal and the place was deserted. All the better, because as we know, this lunch between lovers is not a regular date. So now they walk along the Via del Impero. You saw that, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> off they walk down the Via del Impero and it's already getting warm. Partly it was a fine day, spring day, like we've been enjoying in Rome in the last few days, but it was also stress and nerves. What we now know is the Via dei Fori Imperiali is a 32 metre wide boulevard connecting the Colosseum to Piazza Venezia. It was inaugurated on the 28th of October, 1932 to celebrate the first decade of the fascist regime. As they walk past the resurrected ruins of a glorified imperial past, they're no longer Carla and Sassa, but two Galpisti, their battle names, Elena and Paolo. Gone is Carla's blonde hair and the elegant green suit that so caught Sassa's eye when he first met her in the company of Guido Rattopatore, who helped set up the original Santa Barbara in Via Giulia, had been shot by the Nazis at Forte Brasnitta, not a fortnight before. Carla had actually dyed her black in order not to be recognized. She's wearing an old tartan skirt, her sweater smells of mold and rancid cologne, the cheap kind. Sorry, I have to pause this. Um, not the kind she's been used to since the day she bid her mother goodbye and went into hiding. They are banditen and with a 200,000 lira, which is about 15,000 euro price on the heads. In her bag, she is carrying four Brixia bombs. Now these bombs were usually shot out of a mortar, uh, but Carla had taken the bombs and modified them to be hand, gra hand grenades. She's holding them um, in her shopping bag. Sasa rattles off across the San Pietrini towards Colosseum. Raoul is following behind, keeping an eye out. The cart is heavy and Sasa is already having a hard time of it. I mean, he's a medical student. He's not used to this kind of physical strain. Cardlo is walking on a little ahead with a shopping bag over a shoulder, a bunch of greenery poking out the top um, to hide the four bombs that she's going to give out to her comrades. At six kilos each, it was quite an effort to pretend that her bag contained the usual meager supplies that women could gather on a daily basis to feed their families. And just to give you an idea of food prices at the time in 1944, eggs cost more than a euro. Obviously there weren't euros, this is the equivalent. Um, olive oil is 30, then 45, then 67 euros a flask. Meat is 12 euros a kilo and bread is rationed to 100 grams a day. These are hefty prices for a regular factory worker earning the equivalent of 600 euro a month. With the fall of fascism in July, 1943, Italians basically had to make a choice between an easy life and a hard life. The easy life meant that you, can, you stayed fascist. You consorted and corroborated with the Nazi and the Repubblichini, those people who stayed faithful to the Republic of Salon. And in exchange, you had many privileges like food, warmth, clean underwear. Cardlo used to have an easy life, but now she has chosen that one and she's still getting used to it. Apart from the constant hunger, it meant taking on a false name, never seeing your family and wearing the same clothes day in, day out that hung off you more and more as you gradually got thinner. It meant walking for hours in men's shoes stuffed with paper because they were too big and washing in the dark with a bucket of cold water that only felt warm because the temperature of the cellar was even colder. So who are Kadla and Sasa? I'll just give you a little bit of their background as we walk down the very long Via dei Fori Imperiali. Um, so Carla Caponi and Rosario Bentivegna, who was known to his friends as Sasa, are students at Rome La Sapienza University. She's tall and slim, used to be blonde, with a lively expression and a strong character. He's also thin, well, because a lot of people were at that time, um, with rounded cheeks, full lips and hair swept back from his forehead. Carla is a 23-year-old law student and comes from a nice upper-class family who could never quite get used to fascism. They secretly sided with the Spanish government during the Civil War 
aided Jews persecuted under the racial laws, and her father refused a special fascist party membership card reserved for World War I veterans. After the 8th September armistice, Carla gets involved in anti-fascist activities. In addition to using their centrally located home to distribute clandestine copies of the Unita newspaper, the Caponi family kept a room aside for anti-fascist groups to meet, but that's not enough for Carla. Once the Nazis occupy Rome, she's in the streets assisting soldiers with water and other supplies and tending to the wounded. It is still not enough for her. With her ears full of the feats of Clara Zetkin and Rosa Luxemburg, she decides to join the Carlo Pisacane Central Gap. The accepted role for women was to play the part of the fidanzate, the girlfriends, so the Gapisti could carry out their missions without raising too much suspicion. Sasa is just 22. He's a medical student and member of the Communist Party who had been an active anti-fascist from his high school days and had already done jail time. He came from a family of Roman landowners who lived off the rent from their estates, but this money had gradually dwindled over the years and they lived a modern life. So Carla's walking along and she's thinking about this long, wide avenue made just so that Mussolini could enjoy an uninterrupted view of the Colosseum from his balcony at Palazzo Venezia, and so that there was space in the city to stage a theatre of consent. Before Carla had moved to Palazzo Rocca Giovine opposite Trajan's Markets, this area was a complex urban fabric of winding streets and alleys filled with homes and workshops where people lived, worked and loved. Here were some of the many buildings that fell to the pickaxe, its inhabitants literally banished to the outskirts of the city, to the Borgate, like Quadrado, Centocelle, and Pietralata, that had become so-called wasps' nests of rebellion and rage. This road, made for serried ranks of fascist believers in black shirts and boots to march past the resurrected ruins of the former empire under the watchful eyes of the ancient emperors, this path was now trodden, trodden by three believers of another kind. A momentary separation. So this is the point now you can see where the um, blue path and the yellow path divide. Sasa goes up this way and Kadla goes this way. As Sasa walks past Kadla's house, pushing the rubbish cart, he remembers back to when he first heard of her. There was this woman called Kadla from a bourgeois family of anti-fascists who was collecting military information on the Central Gap Commander for the Central Gap Commander, Luciano Luzana. He remembers thinking, ah, she's a typical figlia di papa, a daddy's girl who got involved with the anti-fascist struggle just to fight off the boredom of her privileged life. He first caught sight of her when he was about to jump on one of the few trams that were still running from Piazza Fiume to Termini Station to make contact with the political leader, Federico Masi, and a cell of comrades working near the agriculture ministry. There he spied Guido Rattopatore in the company of this blonde woman, slim, good looking, wearing a gray green suit that is very well cut. As he jumped on the tram, Guido gave him a quick wave. The woman also smiled and gave a small wave of her hand. Cardler had been challenging Guido to allow her to take a more active role in the resistance, like having a gun, for example. When he tells her women do not get pistols, she decides to get one for herself and actually steals one from an unknowing Republican National Guard on a crowded tram. She shows the gun to the gap leader and he says, sure, you've got a gun, but do you have the courage to shoot it? She answered by taking a shot at a Nazi soldier and was allowed to keep it. As um, Sasa walks up the hill, he remembers the first time he actually met Kadla. He'd been sent to Palazzo Rocca Giovine, that you can see right there, to take a pack of clandestine newspapers to the distribution centre. He still remembers the cool feeling on his skin as he enters the dark doorway. The concierge in his worn out livery did not even give him a second glance. He'd been told that the Caponi apartment was on one of the upper floors and he climbed up the gloomy 128 steps. He rang the bell, short, long, short, as he'd been instructed and a kid opened the door. He looked a bit perplexed at this new face and asked, who are you looking for? Answers. He answers with the code word Arcangelo and gets let in. Then he sees Carla. She's sitting on one of their ornate chairs, playing cards with some other comrades and smoking a pipe. 
how pretentious thinks Sasa, typical bourgeois affectation. That was when he let her background prejudice what he thought of her. He remembers how rude and bad mannered he was, but Carla did not seem to care. She got up from her seat and smiled her open, affectionate smile. I brought you the papers, shall we get to work, says Sasa. Sure, she replies, and then invites him to join their game of Tresette. Their house really was magnificent. A row of windows looking out over Trajan's Forum and all the way across the Campidoglio. Who would have thought that the people reflected in the huge 18th century mirrors lit by Murano lampshades and sitting on Louis XVI chairs were all outlaws doing their bit to rid Rome of Nazi occupation. In front of the windows sat Carla's piano. She had started learning at the age of eight and was first allowed to participate in clandestine meetings by playing the piano loudly enough to cover the conversation from any noisy neighbors. And so although Carla and Sasa fought on their first meeting, they were soon fast friends and went on many missions together, painting graffiti, blowing up trucks on Via Cavour and throwing bombs at Nazi supplies arriving at Stazione Trastevere. So as Sasa heads off up the hill, he sees he can't take the steps because he's pushing the cart. Before the days of automated trucks, rubbish was collected with two wheeled carts. Uh, there were metal bins sat inside a rectangular kind of house-like structure about two meters long. The cart had like large spoked wheels, two long handles to push it along and a support for when the street sweeper needed to park the cart and well, sweep the streets. Poor Sasa, those San Pietrini that he used to think so authentic and picturesque that he used to lament being paved over by asphalt in the name of fascist efficiency. Every lump, every bump, make it that much harder to push that cart. And why did they put two bins inside the cart? It only makes it heavier. Surely one bin with the bomb in it would have been enough. But <laughs> it's too late now. And Ola Madonna, since when were Rome's hills so steep? It's easy to speed up them on a bicycle when you're a carefree medical student, but pushing a bomb-laden cart in a borrowed street sweeper's uniform, knowing you are about to risk your life, is quite another matter. So slowly, slowly, sweating, sweating, he makes it up the hill towards the Quirinale, the obelisk and the warrior demigods, Castor and Pollux, coming to view. It's time to catch his breath. And time for me to catch my breath. So we'll just wait for the video to catch up. So Sasa looks up towards a Palazzo del Quirinale. So, sorry, he's going to be, um, oops, about here. In front of the King's Palace, he runs into two real street sweepers who don't recognize him. Oh, ma che fai da ste parti? Oi, what are you doing around here? Che te frega, says Sasa. Sto a caricare cemento. What do you care? I'm carning some cement. Ha, se, facci vedere sti prosciutti. Show us the hams. And they approach to lift off the lids of the bin and take a look inside. Ma vaff, fatemi cavoli vostri. F off, mind your own business, says Sasa. Luckily for Sasa, the street sweepers just laugh again and leave him to what they assume is some kind of black market racket being run out of the back of a rubbish cart and they leave him alone. They probably can't afford prosciutto anyway. Raul hurries up to see what the fuss was about. And as soon as he sees everything is okay, he drops back and Sasa continues on his way. As Sasa looks up at the Palazzo del Criminale, this former papal residence that had been given over to the king when Rome became capital of the United Italy in 1871. Abbasso pipone, whispers Sasa to himself. The king was held in very low regard by both fascists and anti-fascists, having skipped down after the 8th September armistice, leaving the Italians to their fate. For fascists, he was a traitor because he had given Mussolini the power to rule in 1922 and then signed an arm armistice with the enemy. 
For anti-fascists, he was a traitor because after helping bring Mussolini down in 1943, he left them without any proper government or direction or even understanding what side they were supposed to be fighting on in the war, thus paving the way for the subsequent Nazi occupation that would last for 271 days. He's now going to go along the Aventi September, along this section here. Finally, riding on the flat along the Aventi September, he's thinking about mm, where will I stop the cart in Via Rosetta? Palazzo Tittoni had been chosen as a spot because it was halfway between Via del Boccaccio and Via Quattro Fontane. There was a full 50 seconds where the columnist soldier would have no means of escape from the narrow street. Sassar deliberately puts the cart, will, will deliberately put the cart in the middle of the street so that the soldiers would have to peel off and walk around it. As he walks along, he's thinking about Kadla. What's happening to her right now? According to plan, she'll be in front of the In Masagero newspaper offices. He knows that Pasquale will be coming by to let her know that Silvio, who's further down in front of the Spanish steps, has sighted the column of soldiers. Across in front of the tunnel, she would, she would see Raul and Fernando ready to run to Via the Giardini and throw the Brixia bombs and throw the big Brixia bombs at the rear of the column. What he doesn't know yet is that she would be waiting there a long time. Luckily, there are a copy of the newspapers displayed in glass cases. To distract herself from the agony of waiting, she's reading about the recent eruption of the Vesuvius five days earlier and makes her realise what an isolated life she's been leading lately. It was all hiding and fear with the odd exploding Nazi truck in between. With time on her hands until the signal of Pasquale, Carla at this time is reading the whole article. She's being distracted by the street reflected in the glass, not to mention her nerves. She sees a tall figure in the reflection of the glass it's Giorgio Amendola, a longtime anti-fascist and member of the Communist Party, who would later take full responsibility for the attack. What's he doing here, she wonders, and then goes back to reading the article. The volcano had been spewing forth for five days and showed no signs of stopping. She sees two more shadows in the reflection of the glass and turns to see two plainclothes policemen approach. She's not sure if they intend to arrest her or to chatter up. She decides to ignore them and goes back to the article. The cloud of smoke from the volcano, six metres high. Signorina, permette? Excuse me, miss. What did they say? Signorina, permessi. Miss, your permits. Aspetta qualcuno. Are you waiting for someone? Please, please, please. Don't ask to see my papers, she thinks to herself. She starts to panic. She doesn't have them in her elegant handbag. Sorry, I just have to pause this. Um, she has a pistol instead. If they check, she will be arrested immediately and the whole operation will be aborted. Her only option is to flirt with them a bit while explaining that she's on her way to meet her fidanzato at Palazzo Barberini when she became distracted by the news of this amazing eruption of the Vesuvius. Despite her slightly disheveled clothing, she still manages with her bearing and mode of expression to pass off as a signorina per bene, a nice young lady. They seem convinced, but tend to hang around to keep an eye on her. But as Sassa nears Via Quattro Fontane, he no longer thinks about Carla. The hill towards Via Rosella is also steep. And now he has to confront the opposite problem. How do you stop a cart from getting away and careening down the hill. So Sasa is now here at his station in Via Lazella. As he nears Via Quattro Fontane, he's no longer thinking about Cardla. Sorry, it's 2 p.m. The column was due to come past at 2.15. Now all he has to do is wait for the signal that the Nazi troops are coming up the hill to light the fuse. So as not to raise suspicion, they'd agreed that when one of them gave him the signal, he would light his pipe and then use the match to light the fuse on the cart. 
He had by then realized that partisans actually smoked pipes because there was so little tobacco around. And by using a pipe, you didn't waste those few strands of tobacco that were always left behind in the butts. He has three matches and a pipe containing a tiny amount of tobacco, all they could muster, but not enough for three smokes. That means three chances to light the fuse. Time goes ticking by, 2.20, 2.30, 2.45. The Nazis do not arrive. The concierge of Palazzo Titoni comes out for a chat. Sasa has to find some excuse to get him away from there. They don't want innocent victims if they can help it. So we've left Sasa at his appointed spot in front of Palazzo Titoni. And now it's time to follow Carla's footsteps as she walks through Piazza Venezia. And so we're back here at the split off point and Carla's walking through Piazza Venezia here. Piazza Venezia. Well, until very recently, it was the beating heart of the fascist regime. The Palazzo itself, named as such for the Venetian noble family who had built it as a cardinal's palace in the 1450s. Uh, the Piazza had been transformed during the fascist era from setting for the Vittoriano to rally ground for Mussolini's rousing speeches from the balcony of the Palazzo that he had appropriated for his headquarters and renamed Palazzo del Governo in 1929. This effectively shifted the emphasis towards Palazzo Venezia, relegating the Vittoriano to a backdrop with its steps merely becoming a good place to stand in order to get a better view of the Duce. But Mussolini was no longer there. He was up north on the shore of Lake Garda, trying to rebuild his power base at the head of the Republic of Salo. It had collected fanatics and cowards alike and had soon become a puppet state of the Nazis under German control. Mussolini's most devoted followers were all there, running ministries either by the lake or scattered around northern towns. Mussolini liked to make people believe that Salo was a truly socialist republic, founded on his movement's original aim to set up a collective labour-based economy based on core socialist principles. But everyone called anyone connected with the um, Republic Republicini, with that specific ini um, section of the suffix to make them seem like little people of no consequence. As Carla turns up to walk up Via Quattro Novembre, so she is coming around here. She thinks of Sassa and one of their first missions together. It was a Piazza del Popolo to paint graffiti, a collective action coordinated across Rome for the 7th of November, 1943. 1,000 people were out in the streets after dark to write, Viva Lenin. Viva la Rivoluzione Rossa, Viva Carlo Marx, and Abbasso Tedeschi Fascisti, down with Germans and fascists. And then to really upset them, Heil Karl Liebknecht and Heil Rosa Luxemburg. Sasa, Carla, together with Rodolfo and Anna, had been assigned the area from Piazza del Popolo to Via del Tritone, from the Spanish Steps to Piazza San Silvestro. In 1944, Valadier's Excedras encircled rows of Nazi tanks and trucks. It was the perfect parking spot because the Nazis knew that allies would never dare to bomb an ancient Egyptian obelisk put there by Sixtus V, or the famous gate designed by Bernini, or even the Church of Santa Maria del Popolo with its choir by Bramante and chapel by Raphael. Their comrade Rodolfo Coari had managed to get hold of several paintbrushes and buckets of red paint. Carla and Sassa decided to strike the obelisk fact first, covering it with hammers and sickles. It was a beautiful moonlit night, the perfect backdrop to act like a couple of lovers. 
And she was thinking it would be the perfect for him, uh, way for him to make a move on the woman she sensed he was feeling increasingly attracted to. He casually put an arm around her shoulders as she pulled out brushes from her bag. If she responded, he might say it was just part of the cover, but she packed everything back into her bag and squeezed him tight. The soldiers walked past without blinking an eye, and from that night on, they were more than comrades. So now she's going down Via de la Pilota, which is this section here towards the Trevi Fountain. So as she continues away, she looks up towards the pretty Nale, wondering if Sasa is okay. He was having, at that time, he was having his altercation with the other Neturbini and in more danger than she could have realized. She walks along Via de la Pilota and pass up towards the Trevi Fountain. She's looking up towards the Quirinale, fearing for Sasa. She's now turning off from the Trevi Fountain. Past the Trevi Fountain without a second glance. There are no tourists in Rome anyway. And up via the Lavatore, she goes past the wine bar where only a few days ago, she, Sassa, and two other gapisti, Mario Fiorentini and Lucia Ottobrini, were hatching the plan of attack. They had noticed lately that columns of Nazi soldiers regularly marched from their training ground in the Flaminio district up via the Babuino, past Piazza di Spagna, and up towards the Ministry for the Interior, where a lot of them were stationed. It was pretty regular, about two o'clock, and it was a good opportunity for an attack. The Gapisti had been pretty successful in the last months and were becoming more and more audacious. Lately, they were furious over the assassination of Teresa Gulache, shot in front of the occupied barracks in Viale delle Milizie after trying to get food to her incarcerated husband. A partisan dressed as a Neturbino as a street sweeper could easily place a cart full of explosives in a strategic position and have it explode just as a column of soldiers marches past. Besides, there was also, um, the question was where to put the rubbish cart. Via Quattro Fontane meant ris risking Palazzo Barberini and besides, there was really a little bit of too much military nearby. Via Rosella was a good choice. There were hardly any shops on it. It was narrow and it had an entry section from Via de Boccaccio to Via Quattro Fontane with no side streets. Carla arrives at Via del Traforo now. So she is in this, at that dog leg there. She arrives at Via del Traforo, but she doesn't see Francesco. So she continues on to Via the Giardini and hands in the four bombs, returning with a raincoat over her arm to wait in front of the Il Massagero newspaper offices. Glancing up Via Rosella, she sees a Sassa has not yet arrived. She looks under the tunnel. She looks at the tunnel under the Quirinale. No traffic went through it now. It was used as a shelter during the repeated bombing raids by the Allies, who in their attempt to target train stations and supply lines to cut off the Nazis, had managed to kill thousands of civilians and destroy hundreds and hundreds of homes. Some families had taken refuge there and were doing their best that could they survive. It made living in a cellar in Via Marco Aurelio look positively comfortable. At this point, you'll remember that she's just managed to fend off the attentions of the plainclothes policeman. And Pasquale, who's keeping, keeping watch from the other side of the road, comes over. She thinks it's the signal that the Nazis are coming and she walks up Via Rosella. Carla tells the story that Pasquale had given her a reassuring wink. 
that she took to be the signal. signal. And so asking the policeman what time it was, 1447, she pretends to be frightfully late and scuttles off up Via Rosella. On her way to turn up the hill, Pasquale whispers in her ear as she walks past, is he confirming the signal or just teasing her about the, the courting policeman? Her heart is pounding so hard that it reverberates through her whole body. It feels so much, the hill feels so much steeper than when she'd walked up it a few days before with Spartaco, Carlos Salinari, on their reconnaissance visit a few days before. So she is walking up Via Rosella now. So, sorry, going back a bit. Her heart is pounding so hard that it reverberates through her whole body. It feels, the, the hill feels so much steeper than when she'd walked up it a few days before with Spartaco on their reconnaissance visit a few days before. Her calves are beginning to cramp and only the sight of Sasa halfway up the hill in front of Palazzo Titoni gives her the strength to continue. There he is trying to look like he's sweeping the street. It's quite clear that he's never held a broom in his life. And Carla chuckles inwardly at his clumsiness, but then she's overcome with worry. If he keeps at it, they're going to discover he's not a real street sweeper and the game is up. As she walks past him, he leans the broom up on the cart and she goes to wait in front of Palazzo Barberini. But where is the Nazi column? If that was a signal from Pasquale, they should be at the bottom of the street by now. But they're not. She goes past Sasa and she is now at the top of Via Rosella in front of Palazzo Barberini. Sasa, she's thinking that it's a signal and lights his pipe, but no dice. She stops in front of Palazzo Barberini, hoping that Sasa will be okay. It must have been a false alarm. Carla leans on the gates of the palazzo, keeping an eye on Sasa. And then she sees her two policeman friends have followed her, probably to check on her earlier story. They come up again and ask, why has she got a man's raincoat over her arm? After all, it's a warm spring day. There's no sign of cloud. She explains that he had given it to her to remove a stain. She's waiting for her fidanzato, which is true. Um, Sasa will be wearing the raincoat over his street super clothes when he's not recognised. But she also says her fidanzato is coming to meet her from the officials club in the grounds of Palazzo Barberini, which is not true. She needs to hold their attention away from Sasa and look like she's expecting her boyfriend to come out of the Palazzo gates any minute. They offer a cigarette, but she doesn't smoke, so she feigns interest in them by asking if they are journalists. They were hanging out in front of Il Messaggero, after all. No, we're humble machine compositors, they say, and she's getting more and more nervous. How do you shake these guys off and keep their attention away from Sasa? It was tearing her nerves to shred. Then, as luck would have it, a friend of her mother's walks past possibly up to visit René, her hairdresser, in Via Veneto. So she excuses herself from the policeman and runs to greet her. Carla listens patiently to all her mother's friends' minutely detailed and tedious stories about her family with a relief she had never felt before, but also aware that she had to get her out of the danger zone. Cosa hai fatto i capelli? Quanto sei magra? You're so thin. What's happened to your hair? Says the friend. But she just says, get away from here. The Nazis might be coming. They're checking people's houses. It's about 10 to 4 now. It's about 10 to 4 and she sees Sasa round the corner from Via Rosella. He's walking calmly and slowly as anyone can after they've just lit 32 kilos of TNT. She immediately slips the raincoat on him. They each pull out their pistols and cock them, ready to shoot. Sasa had seen Franco walking up, to, Franco walking up towards him. It might have been the, sim, the, sim, the signal. He takes off his hat, yes, and he hears the strains of the singing soldiers. Hoop my medal, hop my girl, they sing as the 156 men of the 11th Company of the Polizei Regiment Bozen, all armed to the teeth, are marching towards Viminale after a day's target practice. Just ahead of them is Carlo Salinari, 
also known as Spartacle, who walks past Sasa and gives him the single. Sasa lights the fuse and walks calmly and quietly, or as quietly and calmly as you can, to the top of the hill where Kadla is waiting for him. Not far up the hill, fascists and Nazis are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the founding of the fascists in the Ministry of Egypt. because the Nazi column of soldiers, if there's cart is in the middle, half of them have got to go around one way and half got to go around the other way. So maximum impact from the explosion. You can see on the building, the section that was torn off by the bomb and the original section because there's the, it's been remade here. And the portiere, he's here in Palazzo Tittoni and Sasa saying to him, get out of here, the Nazis are coming. It's like, no, what do you mean? And like, so he has to tell him, don't, not get out of here because there's going to be a bomb, but get out of here because the Nazis are coming. And the portiere understands and runs away. And then there's people who are living in the top of this building here that actually get taken away because they think the bomb must have come from the windows of this palazzo. And they're part of the people who then get um, lined up in front of the Palazzo Barberini later to be arrested. Um, <clears throat> so, um, where was they up to? Sorry, so the Nazis are celebrating up in the Ministry of um, Economic Development. Um, Borsani is giving a speech about the difficult situation in Rome. The only city that the Nazi command had to admit was giving them filo da torcere, a run for their money. Towards the end of Borsani's speech, there's a massive explosion, followed by four smaller ones in quick succession. The windows of every building on Via Veneto tremble, including those at the Palazzo della Corporazione. Merlhausen, his press officer Herbert von Borg, and Pizzirani, who is in the midst of boasting of the day's success, is cut, his speech is cut short. Merlhausen and his colleagues rush down to the street. Are the Allies bombing again? No, they are met with a soldier gasping for breath. He's overcome, freaked out. There's been an attack at Villa Zella. 100 Nazi soldiers are wounded, 32 killed, and the 33rd will die later that night in hospital. But there are other deaths. The 13-year-old Pietro Zuccheretti, whose body was blown into pieces and his feet were never found. All the Gapisti had run off, leaving a veritable pandemonium. Shots were being fired in all directions. The Nazis, assuming the bomb had been thrown in one of the buildings in Via Rosella, rounded up everyone they could find and lined them up along Palazzo Barberini. You may remember from Bucarelli's diary entry that some had managed to escape. Others were shot on the spot. The aftermath of the Virazella bombing is a well-known story and the national monument of the Fossa di Atene to the south of Rome honors the deaths of those who died in the reprisal killing. But that is a story for another time. Carla was awarded a gold medal for military valor. And there's one street named after in her honor in the small town of Piana de Albinesi, just outside Palermo. So I'm just going to skip forward now to the end. Because this is an experiment after all. Okay. <clears throat> so as I said at the beginning, um, the traces of this event of Kadla and Sasa walking through the city are not there in the city, but what are, what is there are all of these plaques and these um, memorials to the people who died in the reprisal killing. So tonight, I didn't really have any pretensions about putting forth a bulletproof argument, and I'm not here to claim new territory or reveal stunning new facts. I simply came here tonight to tell a story of a young couple and how they walked through Rome in the early afternoon of the 23rd of March, 1944, changed the course of history and left a legacy that Italy is still grappling with. I need to 
needs to that's it, yep. Um, by tracing their steps across the well-trodden paths of the contemporary tourist, we have discovered together the many traces, deliberate or accidental, apparent or as yet undisclosed, that still remain in the city of the events of Vera Zadla and the consequences that continue to reverberate today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> brilliant experiment, brilliant, really um, brought that story to life and I won't look at those streets again um, without noticing. So it teaches us all to notice. Um, we have time for questions um, from the audience and the online audience. So if, are there any questions from the physical audience? Would you like to start um, while I look at the questions that have come in through the Zoom? Uh, Peter, are you able to no. Any questions? Because I, I, what I wanted to know is that um, Etienne has been accompanying you on this journey. Yes. Um, and so, and you're talking to him as you're doing the filming. So yes, what, that's what right. came out of that kind of partnership and conversation? Well, yeah, look, um, I have to say that coming here, I thought I was just going to have like a classic academic fellowship of like going to book, reading books and going to archives. But then I had all these artists around me and they were just like coming here to be creative and kind of have fun and just do something cool. And here was I going to be like burying my nose in archives. And I thought, what if I do something kind of creative as well? What if I do a sort of creative project instead of just your classical academic project? So... I was talking about Etienne and I were walk, going to um, Santiago La Sapienza to check out the church. And we just came up with this idea of walking through the streets and Peter and Ruben were there as well. So we just said, yeah, why don't we um, actually make a film instead of do a talk? So it was really great because, you know, nothing like this would have ever happened if I wasn't here at mm. the British School with these particular fabulous people who are in the room with me. It really came out of that synergy and it it's just really, it's just really exciting. Yeah, and super, and that you inhabited their personalities yeah. as well. But yes, know, because I wanted to know, and it sort of relates to another question where you know you were getting the narrative from obviously yeah, these books. from memoirs. Yeah. So somebody has asked us from the screen, what happened to Carla and Sasa after after this? Well, they got married, um, and had a daughter called Elena, uh, named after her battle name Elena, which I think is lovely. And it was Elena that talked um, Carla into writing the book as well. So yeah, they. Um, lived happily. Uh, Carla got a gold medal for military valour. Um, Sasa got a silver medal mm -hmm. for military valour. So that's kind of nice too, <laughs> that they both got medals, but the woman got the gold medal, which I thought was great too. Yeah. So are there any questions in the physical audience? Yes, we have one in the second row. Just, just to be a little bit provocative and so much of what we're living through at the moment and what we're seeing in terms of resistance in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, the, the, we, we remember, and, 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 and I think I, I actually, having lived in Rome for many years, but I actually and walk around Rome every day and um, I hadn't realized via Rosella, yeah, so... And, and Rome is such an incredible place to walk around and the visuals, whereas it, it, we all remember, at least personally, and I don't know much about this, but we all remember Fossi Ardiatina, yeah? yeah, where there were 300, I mean, and you were talking about the reprisals, you're talking about the reprisals, which were 340, right. and you're talking about the fact that they survived, I mean, they made this attack very heroic, and they, they, and they survived and they had a daughter, but you mentioned, of course, that there were people just in the innocent people in the building who were just taken out and shot. Plus, and, it, and, and, and the reprisals were 10 to 1. That's right. So in all this, were, do you come across any controversy of, was it worth it? Oh, there's masses of controversy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And it's a terrible thing to ask, but, yeah. you know, this is the kind of debate that com comes out in terms of resistance but if you resist then more people are going to be killed rather than, yeah. so yeah. so so that's it that's the question really well yeah i mean obviously i'm not the debate is so fraught and so 
went on for decades and decades. Of course, I'm just, yeah, you know, what you came across, but, living it and going yeah, through well, it and doing it. What I came it. across was actually yeah. Cardler's uh, reflection on it that she puts in the book. Mm. And she says actually that, the, I didn't have time to put it in, but um, she says that the night before she actually lying awake and thinking, um, what am I doing here? We're actually, we might actually kill innocent people. And maybe these guys who were just walking back from the training room, maybe they've never killed anyone either. But I guess it was kind of more not thinking about individuals and individual experiences, but understanding more that these people were part of a system and that was a deadly system that they had, they had deporting people, they were shooting people. I mean, you know, um, that two weeks before, um, you know, Guido and, um, and Giorgio had been killed at um, people they knew, their friends had been shot by these people. So I guess she kind of, um, explained it away to herself that it's actually a broader thing and we can't be thinking about individuals we're not people now with emotions we're one group of people against another group of people but that's that's what i got out of and they were I, risking their lives themselves yeah. and and it stood out as an heroic act of yeah. resistance because sasa oh. doesn't really talk about any of his emotional states it's like this is what happened and i met this guy and i did that and yeah carla was this like you know, spunky, young, young, blonde woman, you know, that's basically all he says about her. But Cardla, you know, it's called With the Heart of a Woman, her biography, and she actually talks a lot about how she's feeling, how her heart is beating fast, how she doesn't sleep the night before. So you get a really interesting sort of emotional response to what it means to be a guppista by reading the memoirs. And I purposely didn't use archival documents and I personally didn't use contemporary diaries of people who were writing at the time, apart from the Palma Bucarelli one, because I really wanted to um, bring forth the concept of the memory. And so that by taking you through the streets and just filming the streets that you see every day, but taking you back mentally to another part in time, how you could actually maybe inhabit the memory that they had, because we can't, we don't know really what they were feeling, we can only inhabit their memory. So. I wanted you to bring bring you back into the memory of their experience um, that way. So I don't know if that really answers your question. No, no, no. <laughs> but he was he was quite matter of fact about his description of yes. what happened, whereas she was entering into the the yeah. emotion. Yeah. It was really fascinating to read because I read the bits um, parallel. First, I read a bit of Sasa, then I read a bit of Carla, and then I read all of hers, and I read his again, and I read them over the last two weeks. Um, all the time and then we're going back and it was just really fascinating to then try to merge the narrative as half of which is why I had the session where he's thinking about what she's doing and she's thinking about what he's doing mm -hmm. as well yeah mm -hmm. um, we have a question from the online audience and uh, so Alessia Alessia thank you very much for your question she said that you mentioned at the beginning that there were also traitors in this group of resistors. Could you tell us more about them? Um, I don't know that much about Guglielmo Blasi, um, but he does get mentioned as this kind of delatore. So, you know, traitors were usually um, a lot, if you read a lot of the literature about how which partisans actually end up dying, they're the ones who were actually were told on. And um, the way the Nazis did this, they, they knew people were starving, they starved people, um, but they often off, they offered um, monetary rewards to people to actually tell on their comrades. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were putting the tra these, these traders, these delatori, in really difficult positions because they thought, well, I just say one name, they might not get caught anyway, but I'm getting like, you know, 200 lira or, or 2,000 lira, and that's, for them it was worth it because even the people who were the traders were suffering just as much as anyone else. And it was really interesting because when I went to look for photographs of Guglielmo Blasi, there's honorary, honorary photographs of all the different partisans, you know, especially, uh, particularly of the time. The only photo I could find of Guglielmo Blasi on the internet was that one where he looks like some shady mafioso dude, you know, you saw that image. Like, so even in the sort of historiography afterwards, he's shown as this like really nasty shady guy. Yeah. Do we have a question um, from our audience in the room? I've got, I've got quite a question about the memoirs. Is yeah. there a sort of, obviously these two will come out, is there a kind of, and I'm not, this isn't my field at all, but is there a kind of market for these types of memoirs? Is this a kind of growing 
area of publication? Um, were well, they producing them for a, a, with awareness that there was yep. an audience who would be reading them later? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you can still buy them in Fifteen Early today, but you've got to go all the way to the Fifteen Early in Valley Mart Corny. So I have to say that I bought these online and they're secondhand. Mm -hmm. So they're still being printed, and they're still you can pretty much get them on the secondhand market through IBS in mm -hmm. a matter of five days, like I did, because <laughs> otherwise I'd be reading in the library all the time. Interestingly, um, and they're basically in every single library. If you do a um, look up on um, the um, the SBN, the um, network, you look up these two books, practically every library in Italy, communal library, national library has copy of these two books. So I would say that they're there. I mean, they're not the only ones who wrote memoirs. Mm, yeah, I just no, chose no, these no. two because I wanted, I love Tolstoy's War and Peace. Mm. So nothing like, you know, weaving a love story into a war story. Um, no, it's great. So I chose these two people. Thank you very much. Ah, we have a question. Um, just behind Emlyn and bottom right. That's Mark. Mark. <laughs> when the words comes up. Do we know why they wrote two books and not just one as a couple? Oh, why they wrote a book each? Yeah. Oh, um, well, Sasa was, um, wrote his book quite early, like very soon afterwards. Uh, and he was also involved with um, other people like Cesare de Simone about documenting the resistance. So he was much more active in documenting it. She wasn't really interested in getting involved in all the resistance stuff. And she only wrote hers uh, much, much later. So she was much older. And as I said before, she only wrote it because um, her daughter talked her into it. And, you know, she actually reflects on the process of writing as well, why she wrote it what she discovered about herself and her memories through the process of writing it as well. So there's basically two books because I think Carla at the, at the time wasn't interested in remembering any of that stuff. She just wanted to get on with her life. There are no more questions online. Um, and if, uh, Ruben? <laughs> Thank you, Flavia. Uh, this is a curiosity, really, because you've you've hinted at how this is a partly suppressed and uh, forgotten and unresolved history. Is there any form of commemoration at all on the site of the explosion? Anything to tell you that it happened there physically to a passerby? No, um, there's there's nothing. Um, all the commemoration is uh, for the reprisal killing the next day, and in fact, it's on next week. So. Um, yeah, Matt and I are going, if anyone else wants to come. <laughs> um, yeah, but what I thought was so curious is that Via, I, I, when I first went to Via Rosella, I mean, I knew Via Rosella. I mean, my ex-husband used to work there. I used to go and um, meet him for lunch um, out there. And um, there's, there was nothing there. And all I could find was a few shrapnel marks. But as he was telling me the other day, I will um, give Federico credit for this. Uh, he was telling me that the repair on the Palazzo had only actually happened sometime in the 90s. Yeah. And so up until the 90s, there was still, you could see all the bomb damage. So people would have seen that. And I thought, oh, that could be any kind of bomb damage. Um, but no, there's absolutely nothing in the street. But there is a plaque on Palazzo Barberini, which you saw at the end, which commemorates the people that were rounded up and shot there. But on the actual spot of the actual event of this all-important bomb that had such a reverberation in Italian history throughout the decades, I mean, all of the debate that you were referring to it all comes from that one bomb. So why in this one spot of the city is there absolutely nothing? It's almost like it's been covered. I mean, I don't have the answer, but I just find that so fascinating. So I thought there is no physical trace. So Etienne and I made a filmic trace. That was the, that was the, um, the idea. Right. Um, could you tell us more about the graffiti? And whether there are any competing memorial dynamics visible on the surrounding wall? Um, well, the graffiti of the time. Um, yes, the graffiti of the time. Well, as I said before, it's a very important act of passive resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, there was, it, it used to happen um, in various times throughout Nazi occupation. Um, but of course, it's all been cleaned off and it's gone. And I'm also very interested in those traces because they're, they're traces of resistance that are gone now. And we only have them documented in books. 
or stories like, you know, Sasa talking about what they painted where. And so we kind of reconstructed uh, in that way. So yeah, graffiti was um, officially recognized by the, by the CLN, by the um, National Liberation Committee as a form of resistance. So people did it especially, it was about, you know, really pissing off the Nazis, um, which, you know, uh, and it used to get covered over pretty quickly. But they used to also do um, commemorative graffiti. So on Via Giulia, there was, you know, um, Honore a Guido Rattopatore forever um, was written up there. So I've only got documentary evidence of that, but I have been mapping this graffiti um, elsewhere. And the competing memorials, there's no competing memorials around Via Zella. Uh, and there's no memorials to any of the Nazis or the fascists that died in any of this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that answers the Thank question. you for that question, Amy. Thing to see you in June. Um, we have one more question and then I think we will um, pause for in fresco. So, Tom. Yes, thank you very much for that very interesting paper, which I enjoyed enormously. Um, I just wondered, the, the so-called Germans who were victims of this were actually from Bolzano. Weren't they? Yes. And, and I mean, I wonder if that's had repercussions in Italian politics since yes. then, because I can remember back in the 70s, there was a, a terrorist movement trying to get independence from uh, Italy in, in the Alto Adige. And I wonder whether this was seen, this was an issue at all on, on either side, that, that, that these were not really true Germans, that they were actually from uh, south of the Alps, uh, uh, and perhaps they were not the, the right kind of victim, if you can see what I mean by that yep. point. Yeah, no, there was definitely controversy around that, massive controversy, in fact, because, you know, it was all about, um, yeah, uh, you know, what are you doing killing your own, because um, they're Italian. But then again, you know, it, it was a form of civil war. Now, the, the, the partisans will get cross with me for calling it a civil war because it undermines the role of the partisans in the resistance. But it was a time in Italy where Italians were killing other Italians. Because as I said, you know, the, the regime falls in 1943. There's no more fascism. You've got to make a choice. Yeah, you either say, right, well, I was never fascist anyway, or you like going, scales fall through your eyes, you become an anti-fascist, or you stay fascist. So because of that, there is a situation in Rome, in Italy, but also still going on today. Italians are still killing other Italians. It happened all the way through the Anni di Piombo. You might see graffiti around about Valerio Verbano or Paolo Di Nella. They were two um, young men in the 70s and 80s where Italians were killing each other because of the political leaning. So the fact that the um, that the, the Gapisti had killed other Italians, yes, was controversial, but it wasn't anything different from what was actually happening anyway. Italians were killing other Italians because of their political beliefs. Yeah. We were putting that at each other just down here on the steps. Yeah. Down in the steps. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we should say thank you so much for such a wonderful lecture with a round of applause. Um, I can probably, I know that the um, online audience will also be applauding you. Thank yeah. you so much. And thank physical you. audience, please come upstairs and join us for our glass of Prosecco. So thank you so much. Thanks.